previous hearing of the subcommittee on capital markets insurance and government sponsored enterprises will come to order pursuant to committee rules each side will have fifteen minutes for opening statements without objection all members opening statements will be made part of the record I yield to myself five minutes good morning since the start of the financial crisis we have done much work to understand its root causes and to pass robust reform legislation initially in the House and yesterday in the Senate that will end the air of too big to fail financial companies reform credit rating agency operations and regulation and implement a broad array of solely needed measures that will better protect innocent Main Street investors from unscrupulous Wall Street operators in debating these matters accounting and auditing issues have surfaced more than once as a result the house passed Wall Street reform bill includes my reforms aimed at responding to the Madoff fraud by better regulating the auditors for broker dealers this legislation also contains my provisions designed to enhance the ability of security authorities to coordinate foreign and domestic investigations and to improve the ability of the public company accounting oversight board to collect from and share information with foreign entities the bill additionally includes a provision by congressman lee of new york providing for an annual accounting transparency hearing like the one we are having today it further incorporates a provision by congressman miller of california to create a financial reporting form for regulators finally congressman adler and capital markets ranking member garrett both of new jersey amended the bill to exempt small public companies from the sarbanes oxley acts requirements for external audits of international control a provision which continues to concern me at today's hearing we will doubtlessly re-examine each of these matters as well as a pending supreme court case on the process for appointing members of the public company accounting oversight board we will also continue to explore whether or not accounting and auditing standards help to contribute to the financial crisis decisions to move problematic assets off of their balance sheets allowed some companies to hide the real nature of their financial health moreover the recent court appointed examiners report of the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy highlighted the troubling repo 105 practice that some companies may use to embellish their financial viability and inaccurately portray leverage these practices motivated purely by short-term self-interest are not literary works to be admired rather they are fictional stories based on half-truths that have no place in our capital markets accounting standards and those that apply them to ought to portray a company's financial condition candidly and in a way that investors can readily understand today we will also explore what progress regulators and standard setters have made to simplify our reporting framework and produce books that investors want to read we will further examine how to improve accounting transparency decrease regulatory burdens and address old issues like auditor concentration and newer ones like converging accounting rules the financial crisis demonstrated just how interconnected our economic fortunes are capital now moves across international borders at a lightning speed as investors diversify their portfolios and take advantage of opportunities both here and abroad investors therefore need to have access to timely accurate financial information that allows them to make apples to apples instead of apples to oranges comparisons at similar companies around the world while we have more quickly on we have moved quickly on converging global accounting standards we must also proceed carefully to ensure that these rules produce high quality results for investors America's markets and its financial reporting framework are among the most developed in the world because of the independence of standard setting and enforcement to protect the credibility of our markets and instill investor trust we must ensure that any new international system continues to adhere to the core principles of independence transparency and accuracy in closing I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses on the state of accounting and auditing regulation the progress they have each made in improving standards and enforcement 
their priorities, their coordination efforts, and the challenges they now or may soon face. I thank each of them for coming and look forward to their testimony. Now I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member, Mr. Garrett, for five minutes. And I uh, thank the chairman thank for this important oversight hearing today. Thank you uh, for all the witnesses who are coming here today. Um, with all the changes occurring in our regulatory structure, I look forward to uh, all your testimony. Uh, the reason being that accountants and auditors do play a crucial role within our financial markets of ensuring that investors basically have the appropriate and reliable information. Um, so I would like, though, to begin my comments by mentioning the current case that's before the Supreme Court to determine the constitutionality of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, the PCAOB, that was created by the sarbanes oxley Act or SOX. And let me be clear. I believe that the PCAOB, as currently established, is unconstitutional. I believe it is in direct violation of the appointment clause, and I believe when the Supreme Court ruling is delivered, maybe as early as next week, that they'll agree with me on that point. You know, several Congresses ago, I started a caucus in the House. We call it, we do call it the Constitution Caucus, and one of the goals of that caucus is to educate other members of Congress about the constitutional limitations on congressional actions and legislation. Because too many times, members of this body simply abdicate their responsibility to examine each law and determine whether it adheres to the Constitution or not. You know, our founding fathers expressly stated that it is incumbent on all three branches of government, not just the judiciary, to examine and determine the constitutionality of each law before them. So no member of Congress should ever pass a legislation and say, we'll just let the courts decide if this is constitutional or not. Each member must look at each law and determine for themselves if the legislation is within the confines of the Constitution. And maybe if more members had done this, for example, with the health care bill, we wouldn't have passed a basically unconstitutional monstrosity like the House and Senate did. So partly in response to my concerns on the constitutionality of PCOB, I introduced legislation three years ago. We called it the uh, Amend Misinterpreted Excessive Regulation in Corporate America Act, which is basically came out to be the America Act. And one provision in the America Act just simply attempted to fix the appointment clause at the heart of the current case, um, the court case, by requiring that the PCOB, the board be appointed directly by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And if you think about it, had more of my colleagues focused on this issue then, perhaps we would not have had to engage in this very long and drawn out and also costly legal battle that's going on across the street. And when you consider the constitutionality of the PCOB has been given question for a number of years, I'm not sure why we are giving th this same body additional powers and authorities until this is determined. You know, we marked up legislation affecting the PCLB in November of 2009, and less than just a month later, the Supreme Court was hearing arguments of whether the entity should even exist or not. I believe it is prudent before Congress gives different entities more powers that we make sure that those entities are operating in a manner in accord with the Constitution. Now, another issue from the Sarbanes-Oxley law currently being debated as part of the financial regulatory reform package is whether to permanently exempt small businesses from the costly independent order attestation of management internal controls. Now, I know my good friend here, Chairman Konjorski, and I differ on this topic, but during this economic downturn where thousands of small businesses across the country are really struggling just to make payroll, I don't really see how adding one more costly, burdensome regulation, which at best has dubious benefits, will help improve the number of jobs in the country or improve the economy. And so I will repeat my comments from yesterday by stating this is one of numerous ways we can help small businesses without creating another TARP program or throwing in another $30 billion of deficit spending. In regards to the Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB, I look forward to hearing how the changes and additional guidance you have provided to fair accounting uh, so far have worked. I would also like to explore in greater detail with uh, both FASB and the SEC that the recent changes to the securitization rules in 166, 167, and Regulation AB and the potential impact that those new rules, when you com combine them and couple them with the new proposals, will basically have on the availability of uh, the cost of credit. I'm also very interested in learning further on the progress, as I mean, we talked about, of uh, international convergence of accounting standards. Uh, I believe this is a critical long-term goal for our international competitiveness. I want to make sure that we're moving forward, as I think we'll probably hear um, on this expeditiously. So again, I want to thank the chairman for holding this oversight hearing. I think it's 
General oversight hearings with government regulators are very informative. They allow us members to discuss a wide range of issues. I know we're going to do another such hearing next week with FHFA and later on in June with the SEC and Chairman Shapiro. And I do look forward to those. And once again, thank the uh, members of the panel before us. Thank you very much, Mr. Garrett. And we'll now recognize the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, for five minutes. I thank the chairman for holding these hearings. Due to flight schedule, I may not be here till the very end, but uh, I recognize the importance of these hearings. Um, the uh, chairman comments on the action taken by the Senate. Uh, I've been informed that the Senate passed the bill without passing the manager's amendment. If that's true, then Section 210N10 remains uh, a phony limit on the amount that the FDIC can borrow of taxpayer funds. Uh, in order to uh, help the creditors of uh, defunct uh, financial institutions. Uh, I'm confident that anyone who voted for the bill in the Senate really intended the manager's amendment to be part of it and uh, confident that those limits, uh, which are, are so important to the bailout versus non-bailout question, uh, will be dealt with. Uh, these hearings are on uh, auditing standards and accounting principles. I'll leave to others a discussion of the auditing standards uh, and the discussion of Section 404 because accounting principles are so important. Corporations dedicate their focus to showing higher earnings per share. He who controls the rules controls the behavior of corporate America. The FASB therefore has the highest ratio of anonymity to power of any entity in the business world. I've been one of the loudest voices in Congress for the independence of the FASB, uh, not because I was convinced they were doing a great job, but because I thought they would do better and I wasn't so sure that Congress would be helpful. And I was also told again and again, don't worry, international standards are on the way and they'll solve all the problems. Uh, Mr. Ertz, uh, we'll get the international standards when you and I get here. Uh, the, uh, and so we do have to take a look at whether the accounting standards make any sense from an accounting theory standpoint. Uh, th accounting theory would tell you that two companies should be comparable and that companies that are virtually identical uh, should have identical results notwithstanding superficial differences. And yet we still allow one company to choose LIFO and another company to choose FIFO. Why? Well, because accounting theory isn't as important as just keeping everybody happy. Uh, let the business world do what they want. Investors figure it out on your own. Uh, we uh, dealt with uh, some uh, uh, non-optional requirements with stock options, and I think uh, that may have been a step in the right direction. As to mark to market, these much ballyhooed rules don't really give you comparability because if one bank invests in a hundred million dollar uh, loan on a shopping center which they hold for their own portfolio they made the loan the old-fashioned way and another invests in a hundred million dollars worth of uh, a collateralized debts collateralized by shopping centers perhaps identical shopping centers the two would be treated differently under this rule and yet all the shopping centers are down in value not just the ones where the debt happened to be uh, uh, securitized. But the, mo the biggest problem the FASB has is the desire to go with the verifiable rather than the relevant, the desire to make it easy on the auditor rather than useful for the investor. And the be best example of this, and by far the most harmful uh, act that nobody ever talks about, is FASB number two which requires the write-off of all research expenses, penalizes those companies that choose to do research while we in Congress are providing large benefits to those same companies. And while I think most people agree that the success of America depends upon the research done in the private sector. This isn't good accounting. Good accounting says you're supposed to capitalize research expenditures that provide useful results. Why do we have FASB number two? Because good accounting theory would require accountants to distinguish between useful and useless research projects. That's difficult. 
That's like eliminating the strike zone in baseball and saying every pitch is a strike because the umpires don't want to be second-guessed as to their ball and strike calls. The fact is, for us to be penalizing those corporations that engage in research, making them write off the money they spend, providing higher earnings per share to those companies that choose not to do research, and to do this not only in the high-tech sector, where I think investors may be savvy enough to adjust for it, but in the rest of our economy where research is also important, is the most harmful thing that's been done to our economy that nobody knows about. So I look forward uh, to uh, going back to good accounting when it comes to research instead of adopting a system that is easy for the umpire and terrible for everyone in the ballpark. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Campbell, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I am one of the two CPAs on the committee here, along with my California colleague, Mr. Sherman, and I remember when I was first getting my certificate, and, you know, accounting was a very nice, steady thing, boring. One of the three of your organizations didn't even exist. Uh, we would have uh, probably never had this hearing because nobody would have cared and nobody would have come. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, I guess that is not the, the case anymore. And uh, accounting, as my colleague Mr. Sherman pointed out, for many entities and many things is now under a great deal of scrutiny and under the spotlight. One thing I, we do not, any of us, want this to yield is that we up here in Congress start to dictate accounting standards. That is the worst possible result we could ever get to because we will politicize them. And we will, we will not make a judgments on the basis of proper accounting, good accounting, any kind of reasonable judgment. We will make them on the basis of what groups here are powerful and what ones are not, and, and have different accounting standards for the same companies uh, that are different sizes or in different states or with different treatments. And we don't want to go there, and we don't want to be there. So, but because of the, the focus on accounting, it means that FASB and other organizations are, uh, will need to be more responsive and I think quicker in, in response to things that have happened out there. A few things that I'd like to talk about. One thing we do deal with, though, are reporting standards for public companies uh, and also um, banking regulations. And a couple things I'll mention that in my short time here that hopefully will come out over time is um, uh, I am, for example, supportive of going from quarterly financial statements to every six months financial statements and other things that we might do in order to try and reduce volatility um, in the markets. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Garrett, mentioned harmonization with international accounting standards. I'd like to hear what you all think is happening or can happen and so forth on that because we shouldn't be having situations where two, two international companies ba based in different countries have completely different accounting reporting on the same uh, fundamental results. Um, what's going to happen if th the banking sector is far from being out of the woods and far from being out of the problems of 2008? What's going to happen if banking regulations start diverging from accounting regulations, if some of the things that we do and are looking at in terms of reserves and so forth diverge from accounting? And then also, um, I wondered about financial statements and financial reporting in general. It hasn't changed a whole lot since when I took the exam some years ago, decades ago. Uh, but yet markets today are using a whole lot of other measures and metrics to evaluate the performance of companies than the traditional uh, three financial statements that we have been putting out for decades and decades. Now, much of that information may be derived from audited results, and I understand that, but should we be taking a look at uh, what we are auditing and what we are reporting given uh, the realities of the market today, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. We'll now recognize Mr. Sherman for five seconds. Five, five seconds for uh, I misspoke uh, in a way when I said the manager's amendment had not been adopted by the Senate. They adopted the first manager's amendment. They uh, failed to adopt the second manager's amendment, and we can breathe a little easier. I yield back. Only an accountant would want it's an occupational hazard, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> now recognize the gentleman from Colorado uh, for two minutes. Thank you. And it'll be much shorter than that. I just appreciate you all um, being here today. 
Uh, we tangled a little bit the last time uh, you all were here. I, and I just want to say uh, thank you uh, to working with various people, various parties, various industries uh, in helping us move through a very difficult time uh, for this country financially. And I would say to my friend, Mr. Campbell, I agree, for the most part, the accounting um, um, profession, it, there's a lot of object, objective kinds of things. Two plus two equal f equals four. We've come through a time, though, where there was some subjective analysis that had to, to be um, involved. And I just appreciate uh, the willingness of the board, of the different agencies, uh, for looking at bigger picture um, and, uh, quite frankly, helping us get through a very difficult period. So I look forward to your testimony. Appreciate you being here today. Thank you. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Perlmutter. And now we'll recognize the gentleman from Illinois for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in the wake of the financial crisis that we went through and the destruction of, largest destruction of wealth in human history, approximately $17.5 trillion of household net worth in the last 18 months of the previous administration, um, a lot of attention is focused on the pro-cyclical versus counter-cyclical effects of accounting standards. And much of the attention has focused on providing relief um, after the bubble has burst. And I think it is more important to adopt counter-cyclical accounting standards that actually suck energy out of the bubble on the way up. And it seems to me that the, the key principle there is to treat skeptically the value of recently appreciated assets. And we're going to have a workshop next month at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, which will include Alex Pollack and Mark Zandi, two frequent witnesses in front of this committee, um, on preventing the next real estate bubble, which I think is the single most important thing we have to do. And, and we're going to look, among other things, specifically at, uh, at proposals to calculate the loan to value for mortgages using not simply the, the current market price, but the current market price deflated by the amount that real estate has gone up regionally in the last several years. And if that had been in place, I think it, it's very clear that that would have just sucked all the energy out of these enormous real estate housing bubbles that we've gone through and that have been the big dog in destroying net worth. Um, and, and so that's one of the specific things I, I'd like to hear your reactions on. Um, secondly, um, the PCAOB I found to be a very interesting model as the possible way forward for the oversight of the rating agencies. You know, I think frankly that there is no satisfactory solution to the conflict of interest in the rating agency models. The PCAOB was a was a, an attempt to deal with similar conflicts of interest on the uh, um, in the accounting business, and I'd be very interested in, in people's general reaction and how effective that that approach has been, because it's. To my mind, you know, the best the best stab at that, and I was partly successful in getting amendments in um, into the regulatory reform bill. Um, and the third issue has to do with the the high frequency accounting standards for firms, um, especially large training firms, where things can fluctuate on a day to day or hour to hour, or even minute to minute basis. And you're not going to be able to you know just publish reports that continuously update. But we're going to need to have um, something some mechanism of looking over the shoulder of these large firms with very high volatility to understand that and give investor confidence that there, there are at least systems in place so that there are good real-time monitoring of, of these. And that's different than just publishing a, publishing a report every six months or a year. Um, anyway, so those are what I see the, the big issues here, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Foster. Are there any other members that uh, desire time? If not, we'll move to our panel. Uh, first, thank you for appearing today before the subcommittee, and without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. You will each be recognized for a five-minute summary of your testimony. And first, we have Mr. James Coker, Chief Accountant, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Mr. Coker. Chairman Kanjorski, Ranking Member Garrett, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Jim Croker, Chief Accountant in the Office of the Chief Accountant, which advises the Commission on accounting and auditing matters. And I'm pleased to testify today on behalf of the Commission. One of the lessons from the financial crisis is that financial reporting plays a critical role in establishing, maintaining, and in certain cases, rebuilding investor confidence. 
The objective of financial reporting is to provide decision useful information for capital allocation. Market participants must be confident that the information they receive is neutral, it is reliable, and it portrays the economic results in an accurate and faithful manner. As the agency empowered to be the investor's advocate, the Commission is responsible for this reporting. To further ensure the integrity of this reporting, the federal securities laws mandate that an independent audit by qualified professionals be performed. As more fully described in my written testimony, in discharging our responsibilities, we oversee the work of the FASB and the PCAOB. And we do that to monitor existing accounting and auditing standards for potential improvement and to increase consistency in the application of those standards. Let me just outline from my written testimony some of the pending proposals and emerging issues in these areas. Let me turn first to what is often referred to as off-balance sheet accounting. Last year, the FASB issued standards relating to the accounting and the related disclosure with respect to what are often referred to as special purpose vehicles, which include many securitization structures. The new standard should enhance financial reporting by better portraying a company's risk exposure. Of course, we will continue to review the reporting practices to determine if companies are complying with their requirements, and we will continue to see whether further improvement is warranted. We're al also focused on the Commission's ongoing consideration of global accounting standards and the convergence of U.S. GAAP and IFRS. The Commission has engaged significant efforts toward the development of a single set of high-quality, globally accepted standards. These efforts are reaching a critical stage, and in February, the Commission directed my office to execute a work plan to evaluate the areas relevant to further incorporating IFRS into the U.S. financial reporting system. We will begin providing public progress reports on our work no later than October of this year. Another critical component to our consideration of conver is convergence between the FASB and the ISB, which is further co covered in my written testimony. Turning to audit auditing, PCOB oversight of the auditing profession has provided clear benefits to financial reporting quality and to investor protection. As you may know, the PCOB is currently facing a constitutional challenge before the Supreme Court. We are hopeful that the PCOB's constitutionality will be upheld so its important work can continue uninterrupted. If not, the Commission stands ready to issue any necessary guidance to provide continuity. If congressional action is needed, we will pr promptly provide technical assistance so changes can be considered as quickly as possible. Another challenge facing the PCOB is the inspection of overseas auditors whose reports are filed with the Commission or who perform, who perform audit work for U.S. issuers. Access to these firms has been hampered by the PCOB's inability to share information with their foreign counterparts. I would like to thank Chairman Kanjorski and this subcommittee for their leadership in including a provision to address this issue in the House Regulatory Reform Bill. I would also like to thank the Chairman and this subcommittee for another provision in the bill to address the important issue of PCOB oversight of auditors of broker-dealers. Clarifying the PCOB's authority will improve audit quality and strengthen both investor protection and broker-dealer compliance. In closing, a significant lesson from the recent crisis is the same one underlying the commitment to securities regulation over 75 years ago. That is, transparent financial reporting is critical when pressures are highest and investor confidence may be shaken by uncertainty. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Coker. And next we have Mr. Robert Hertz, Chairman, Financial Accounting Standards Board. Mr. Hertz. Chairman Ken Jorsky, Ranking Member Garrett, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's hearing. The FASB is an independent private sector organization whose mission is to establish standards of financial accounting and reporting for U.S. non-governmental entities. Those standards are recognized as authoritative generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP by the SEC for public companies and by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants for other entities. GAAP is essential to the efficient functioning of the U.S. economy because investors, creditors, donors, and other users of financial reports rely heavily on credible, transparent, comparable, 
and unbiased financial information to make their resource allocation decisions. An independent standard setting process is the best means of ensuring high quality accounting standards since it relies on the collective judgment of experts informed by the input of all interested parties through a thorough open deliberative process. However, we are also fully appreciate that the FASB does not operate in a vacuum. The FASB is accountable in two important ways. First, by engaging in robust due process and setting standards, including wide consultation with stakeholders. And second, by being subject to oversight conducted in the public interest by both the fin Financial Accounting Foundation's Board of Trustees and by the SEC. Our very extensive process involves public meetings, public roundtables, visits to interested parties, and of course the exposure of our proposals for public comment. We meet regularly on both a formal and informal basis with the SEC and PCOB and their staffs and with bank regulators. FASB and FAF also regularly brief members of Congress and their staffs on, on developments. Indeed, a number of FAF trustees and FASB board members will be meeting with members of Congress next week. Over the past year, the FASB has acted vigorously to improve U.S. GAAP, especially by addressing reporting issues emanating from or highlighted by the financial crisis. The standards we issued in 2008 and 2009 made improvements to U.S. GAAP in a number of areas, including the valuation of financial assets, especially in inactive markets, securitizations and other involvements with special purpose entities, accounting and disclosure for impairments, credit default swaps and other derivatives, and for financial guarantee insurance. In these and other standards we have issued in recent years, we have focused on communicating clear objectives and principles supported by a sufficient level of implementation guidance. The FASB has also reduced complexity in the U.S. financial reporting system through the launch last July of the accounting standards codification. The codification will benefit everyone in the financial reporting system by replacing the previous myriad of separate accounting pronouncements with an easily accessible, topically organized online research system, which also links in the XBRL U.S. GAAP financial reporting taxonomy. During the past year, we have made good progress working with the International Accounting Standards Board on projects aimed at improving both U.S. GAAP and international financial reporting standards and achieving convergence between those standards. Many of these projects are nearing their exposure draft stage. On some of the projects, I believe the boards are on track to both make the desired improvements to U.S. GAAP and IFRS and achieve convergence, while on other projects, achieving substantial convergence is proving to be quite a challenge. Let me be clear. We are committed to and are making every effort to foster convergence between U.S. GAAP and IFRS. But consistent with our mandate under Sarbanes-Oxley, we must also ensure that the resulting standards represent improvements that are in the best interest of U.S. investors and other users of U.S. GAAP information. My written testimony also details our extensive efforts regarding the private company and not-for-profit sectors. I've also been asked to comment on financial arrangements that companies may employ to manage their financial position near the end of a reporting period, presumably including arrangements such as the so-called Repo 105 transactions engaged in by Lehman Brothers. As I explained in a letter to the committee last month, the FASB does not have any regulatory or enforcement powers, but we do work very closely with the SEC and stand ready to take any additional standard setting actions that may be appropriate as they obtain further information concerning the practices of financial institutions. In conclusion, the demands on accounting standard setters that stem from the financial crisis, together with the goals of continuing to improve U.S. GAAP and of achieving convergence between U.S. GAAP and IFRS, have made this past year one of the more challenging in the FASB's 37-year history, and I expect that the coming year will also be equally as challenging. Uh, thank you again, and I'd be pleased to respond to any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Hurt. And now, finally, we'll hear from Mr. Daniel Gelser, Acting Chairman, U.S. Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. Mr. Gelser. Uh, thank you. Chairman Konjorski, Ranking Member Garrett, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today on behalf of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. Congress created the board in 2002 to provide rigorous, independent oversight of public company auditors. 
I would like to summarize how we discharge our responsibilities and how the board has responded to issues raised by the financial crisis. I also want to mention some challenges we currently face. The board has four basic functions. First, no accounting firm may prepare or substantially contribute to an audit report for a company that files financial statements with the Securities and Exchange Commission without first registering with the PCAOB. There are currently about 2,500 board registered accounting firms in 87 countries. Second, the board conducts a continuing program of inspections of registered firms' public company auditing, including reviews of individual engagements and evaluations of firms' systems of quality control. Since 2003, the board has performed more than 1,300 such inspections and reviewed aspects of over 6,000 public company audits, including 173 non-U.S. inspections. Third, the board has broad authority to sanction firms and associated persons that violate applicable laws. The PCOB has announced the resolution of 31 enforcement proceedings. These cases do not, however, fully reflect the board's enforcement activity since they do not include ongoing investigations and contested disciplinary proceedings, which are by statute non-public. Fourth, the board sets the professional standards for public company auditing. The board has an active program to update and strengthen the auditing standards. Our standard setting agenda is appended to my written testimony. I want to turn next to the uh, financial crisis. The financial crisis affected our work in three basic ways. First, our inspection program is designed to focus on difficult audit issues. We're currently reviewing the results of the recent inspection cycles and intend to prepare a report on findings from those inspections related to the impact of the financial crisis on auditing. Second, this inspection experience has also informed several ongoing standard setting projects including risk assessment, use of specialists, and auditor communications with audit committees. In addition, the board's chief auditor has issued a series of practice alerts on crisis-related audit issues. Third, the enforcement staff has opened several investigations related to audits of public companies involved in the financial crisis. As I've noted, these matters are non-public. Before closing, I want to mention three challenges we currently face. First, we are not at present able to conduct inspections in the European Union, Switzerland, or China. Significant audit work on which investors and in SEC reporting companies rely occurs in these countries. One of the obstacles, particularly in the EU, has been the board's inability to share confidential inspections and investigation information with foreign audit oversight authorities. Section 7602 of the Wall Street Reform Act, passed by the House last year, would correct this problem. The Senate Financial Services Bill contains a similar provision. Hopefully, enactment of the information sharing provisions will allow EU inspections to go forward. The second challenge relates to overseeing auditors of securities broker dealers. While such auditors must register with the PCOB, we currently lack any authority over their work. Both the Reform Act and the Senate Financial Services Bill would extend board inspections, enforcement, and standard setting authority to audits of broker dealers. Both bills would close the gap between broker dealer auditor registration and board authority over these firms. Finally, there's a pending challenge to the board's constitutionality. That litigation, now before the US Supreme Court, deals principally with the way in which board members are appointed and the circumstances under which we could be removed. I expect the court to issue its decision within the next few weeks. The PCOB won in the district court and in the Court of Appeals, and we hope the Supreme Court will reach the same result. If the PCOB does not prevail and the decision requires a legislative change, I would urge Congress to act quickly to fix whatever structural problems the court identifies. The need for investor protection through independent oversight of the auditing profession is as great today as in 2002 when the board was created. 
Uh, my written statement covers these topics in greater detail, and I would ask that it be made part of the record. Certainly happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gelford. Um, I thank the panel for their testimony, and I suspect that we have some questions here from our panel. Uh, not to be facetious, Mr. Croker, uh, I'm going to ask the question, why do I get the feeling sometimes that we are playing a game of cops and robbers, uh, waiting always behind the fact to find out what happened and then close, quote, loopholes or take positions? Uh, the repo 105 problem, wasn't that observed and wasn't that evaluated at some point to be an attempt to avoid transparency? And if that were the case, doesn't the SEC have the authority in conjunction with these other entities to propound rules to prevent that from happening? Or if, if you don't have that authority, why wasn't that requested to Congress for additional authority? I, uh, oh, this question is predicated on the fact that when I talk to my constituents, they're not nearly as sophisticated as you all are, uh, but, but they don't understand why we're always catching up, playing the game of catch up, as opposed to why we don't have a system that prevents some of this abuse. Maybe you can give me those. I suspect, I in some respects, it goes back to the, the issue of are we going to continually be playing cops and robbers goes back to human nature and that when a standard is put in place, there are very uh, ingenious people who work to design around that. One of the, the things that the SEC um, did coming out of uh, the post-Enron reforms was to do a study on accounting standards themselves recommending that the proper balance is to come up with an objectives-based standard. That is, we shouldn't lean too heavily on only principles by which you can circumvent the principle or try to circumvent the principle by creative structuring. But if you lean too heavily on a rules-based system, we've seen the outcome of people saying, well, the rule didn't catch me, if you will. I'm suggesting an optimal balance in our view of sufficient specificity of the objective of the standard coupled with uh, guidance that would help you operationalize that in practice. A uh, number of uh, the FASB's recent standards I would characterize in that vein, their standard on uh, business combinations, their uh, relook at off-balance sheet accounting in statements 166 and 167 that dealt with off-balance sheet and securitization accounting, providing a clear objective of the standard. So I suspect that in some uh, form it will be human nature for some small minority to try and escape that. But the second piece of that question then is do we have uh, the authority? And yes, we do have the authority. Uh, an important, in my mind or my way of thinking, an important uh, element of ensuring that the conduct doesn't continue is enforcing standards where standards are already in place as opposed to suggesting that the standard itself should change if the standard is clear. Well, in enforcing those standards, uh, are we uh, remiss in giving you certain authority? I mean, l let's say an accounting firm purposely concentrates on avoidance for the purpose of changing leverage or giving a false impression of a company's financial condition. And that's quite apparent from what went on. I mean. Uh, you know, nothing is 100 percent, but the high probability is up in the 90 percentile. Uh, do you have the a power to say, look, if you persist in that type of operation, we're not only going to put some conditions on the company or p potentially fines or what can be levied, but we're going to bar you from practicing, that you're just not going to be allowed for a given number of years, or we're going to fine you individually as an accounting firm? I mean, it just seems to me we're constantly chasing, and I, s I use the term cops and robbers, to, f to the level of real frustration. Uh, I'm trying to think of the operation down there in uh, the, uh, 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 the s in the south, the guys putting the, the accounts offshore. 
what? Stanford Financial. I mean, that was observed for a number of years what he was doing and that it was putting in jeopardy uh, investors and citizens. And when I've talked to those groups, uh, they, they just thought it was clearly something that government regulation had uh, addressed and would not allow it to happen. Now, that wasn't under the SEC. That was under bank regulators and others that would have the authority there. But it, it just seems to me people just said, well, it's not a clear case for us to get involved. We're not going to get involved there. I guess the question I'm asking you, is there something we can put in this reform bill now that makes it so clear that we're just not going to take it anymore for not just creative accounting, but for fraudulent accounting, for avoidance of, of, of truth and injury to the average investor? Something we can do here? One, we do have authority, including authority of borrowing accountants from appearing and practicing. We've used that authority uh, with respect to firms, I believe, since the 2002 era, 66 times against firms and se multiple of that against individual accountants. Uh, but I can certainly think more fully and get back to you if there are more specifics. I, I'd appreciate it. I'm going to take one more minute, even though I'm over time. It, it violates what I call the bastard rule, and I want to leave with that because I, it sounds as if I'm assuming that all accountants don't do their job. The fact is most accountants and most business executives do the right thing, want to do the right thing, want to engage in fairness in their businesses, but if you've got an element of 3 or 5 percent, those are my bastard violators, you almost get forced into doing the same thing they did, or you're going to be at a decided disadvantage after a while. And, and we've got to find a way of getting them out of the system. Uh, so uh, join me in my bastard hunt, if you will. I appreciate it. Gentleman from New Jersey. Thank you, and thanks to the panel again. Um, starting, excuse me, sir. Um, you may have heard, if you were listening to the uh, hearing that we had the other day, I gave an example of a company in my uh, district um, that manufactures uh, products for uh, our troops overseas. The company is a $3.5 million market cap. They have about 30 employees, a CEO, a CFO, uh, and the COO all work basically in the, uh, in, in the same room, if you will. Um, and they told me uh, weeks or a month ago that if they don't receive a permanent exemption from the 404B um, requirements, that they will have to pay uh, upwards to $100,000 by the end of the uh, second quarter to uh, get things up and, uh, and, and uh, working to be in compliance. That's only um, four, uh, five, six, uh, six weeks away. So, you know, in light of where the economy is right now, I guess the short question is, is you know, what do I go back to tell them that it's it's better that they spend about a hundred grand to uh, be in compliance with a little tiny company like them with 404B as opposed to using a hundred thousand dollars to you know hire another employee or two or um, uh, make sure their stuff is up to snuff with regard to that they're sending overseas to our troops. Uh, the objective of the attestate the auditors opining on or giving an opinion with respect to 404 uh, wasn't to put in place a, a costly or be non-beneficial requirement and investors uh, that I speak to almost unanimous, unanimously both with respect to individual companies but as well as the financial system as a whole indicate that they receive uh, significant benefit from knowing that there's increased quality to financial reporting and it goes back to the 1977 Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, where an integral part of strengthening financial reporting is strong internal controls. That doesn't mean that the cost should be disproportionate. The SEC, working with the PCOB, uh, has taken a number of steps to reform the cost going back to the outset of, of 404 and what we heard. You've got to admit, $100,000, and when you're dealing with a little tiny company, a $3.5 million market cap company, is uh, a lot of money. Um, and so I just don't know where, when you're talking about uh, uh, the transparency that you're trying to get with a little company like this, uh, does the cost really uh, uh, meet the, uh, uh, the, the benefits? Isn't there some level that maybe the, uh, the cost exceeds the benefits when you're getting down to this size? That's not talking about when you're talking about the, uh, 
GMs of the world, well, who knows whether GM, I guess we have a whole different situation with GM. Let's see how well it worked with them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get in the so is there confidence an that the individual investor has when they put that money at stake in a company that size, we hear from them that they take tremendous confidence, not just from the gap financials, but the process. Yeah. And I appreciate that obviously there is uh, then balancing that trade off between what are the costs and what are those benefits. Well, how, uh, someone just mentioned to me, uh, with regard to the SEC itself, um, uh, with regard to their own internal uh, control requirements, that the GAO required certain, um, GAO has certain internal audit requirements. Is it, is it the case that the SEC has not met their own requirements to set those, uh, those audits? So we do have the GAO um, does an opinion, or effectively the equivalent of 404B, the yeah. Auditor opinion. So, so how'd you do? SEC, how'd the SEC do? Uh, we did have a material weakness. Okay, so. A and the process by which we looked at our own controls and the GAO taking an independent look at that has actually caused a significant increase in, in our internal focus on financial reporting. Yeah, so I mean, so, so we're, asking, we're asking this little company to try to meet some standards that the SEC can't meet. Now, of course, the difference is the SEC gets um, all the money they need, basically, to do so. And this, this little company here is just, I don't want to say they're holding on. That would make them sound like they're not doing well. I think they are doing okay. Uh, so you can see how these, the CEO of a company like this might say, hey, it doesn't seem right. The SEC can't even meet its standards, and yet they're coming and saying that uh, uh, we're supposed to meet a standard that they can't even meet. Do you see the problem that I have in discussions with folks like that? Yeah, the standard, I guess, itself is an opinion on controls same as the opinion, uh, taking a self-look at controls, the SEC internally ported, reported a material weakness as the GAO agreed, so it's the same assessment that we're asking companies to do. But you just can't do it. Okay, but j just in the time that I have left, um, so we have this, had the discussion with regard to trying to make, look at companies uh, with regard to SIVs, the outside these, the maybe one of the areas we had problems with these uh, in, in the past. Um, where the uh, companies actually had controls of the SIVs in the past and say that they should all be on their own balance sheet, right? And that's, some, that's a good thing? Uh, one word answer. Is and yes, you're nodding yes. And so if that's a good thing, if we want to have transparency and openness and what have you, shouldn't we really be doing the same thing for the federal government? Don't we have an entity right here with the GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, where you basically have an entity where the CBO says, these are, con these are entities out there that actually are controlled by the federal government right now, and that for, the, for all honesty and transparency, if we were to treat the GSEs like we are trying to treat all these public companies, wouldn't they be, have to bring the GSEs onto our budget? If you apply the, your rules to how we run our, our system? I, I've not done that, uh, that, that exact analysis, but the criteria are uh, it essentially in layman's term that if you're running the show and you've got significant skin in the game that it comes it's on your books yeah I mean we can we control it we fund it uh, we, we decide who's in charge of it those are and this is one other criteria yeah. uh, under, under our standard uh, that's the approach right I see my little red lights on but thanks for the nod and thanks for this thank you mr. Garrett and now we'll hear from mr. Perlmutter for his five minutes Thank you, and again, I appreciate you um, being here, and, and I have to smile. Uh, Mr. Hertz, I think you were the master of the understatement when you said you'd gone through a few challenges over the last 18 months. I think, you know, accounting industry, pretty much every industry has been stressed uh, to the max. And again, you know, I, I, I do want to uh, compliment um, the industry, the profession, the board, uh, as a whole, because this has been a heck of a time for this country, but, you know, as Americans do, they roll up their sleeves, they get, move forward, they deal with the problem, and do the best job they can. And so I just want to start with that. I mean, we're, you and I may not agree on some things from time to time. Uh, Mr. Garrett and I often don't agree, but we do agree on the uh, point that he was making about his company um, and that the the burden of some of the accounting measures uh, to smaller organizations uh, sometimes can just be 
too much and i know we here in the congress need to consider that and i would ask that you three do now uh, mr gelser my question to you is made off ok who is watching i mean you can have lots of people you know looking over everybody's shoulder and it goes on and on and on and on but in that instance what what repercussions who's the policeman for the accountants who apparently said okay year after year to the statements that were coming out of the Madoff organization Mr. Madoff's auditor was not registered with the PCOB and was not required to be registered with the PCOB because at that time the SEC had exempted broker-dealer auditors from PCOB registration so we had no contact whatsoever with them okay. my understanding is that they should have been subject to peer review that is a, a review by under an industry run system by another firm but they um, misled the AICPA as to whether they were conducting audits and therefore they weren't subject to okay, peer but review. You, you said at that time is there now a new regulation in place or is, are, are, is that kind of accounting still uh, exempted oh yes now, the SEC's exemption that caused auditors of broker dealers not to be registered with us expired at the end of 2008 shortly after the Madoff events became public as a result of that uh, we picked up another probably 550 firms registered with us all auditors of broker dealers are now required to be registered with the PCOB the difficulty is we have no other authority over them. We can't inspect their work. We can't write standards for how their work is performed. Perhaps most importantly, we couldn't bring an enforcement action. If, if the Madoff situation repeated today, Mr. Madoff's firm would be registered with us, but we wouldn't be able to take any action. Again, so I mean, what? So now that they're registered with you, you you're basically telling me you can't do anything. Uh, but they're I, registered with you. Uh, I am. I am telling you exactly that. However, fortunately, from from our perspective, the financial services legislation that the House passed, thanks to this committee, includes an amendment that would give us authority, inspections, uh, enforcement, and standard setting authority over the auditors of these now registered with us broker dealer auditors. Do you do you know if the Senate version has that? I cuz I don't know. Yes, the Senate has a okay. slightly uh, a somewhat different version of it, but from a big picture standpoint, uh, yes, it, it does. And this is very important to us because we're concerned about the fact that the public might perceive that we have some responsibility now for these firms, particularly in light of the Madoff situation when in fact we we simply currently lack the capacity to to do anything with them. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Paramount. And a gentleman from California, Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, wanted to focus a little bit on rules versus principles based accounting, which was touched on a moment ago. Um, we've increasingly moved to rules based accounting, in part, I believe, uh, because of litigation risk and because of the uh, desire of, um, of uh, accounting firms to have a in the accounting industry to have a safe harbor a place they know they can go uh, and uh, and not have litigation but that's resulted in some very 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 complex FASB um, uh, um, pronouncements and so forth I have one I should have brought it I have a <coughs> KPMG summary of the stock option um, which uh, uh, um, pronouncement which is about this thick and I actually took a seminar on that, eight hours on that, and it was the beginning seminar. There was like three more days on that if you wanted to do the rest of it. Um, what do each of you feel about rules versus principles-based accounting, and should we be moving in one direction or the other, and how do we get there? Start with you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. My, re My reaction would be that you need to find a balance between the two. We should have a system that has a clear objective of the standard, uh, but it goes to um, your opening remarks that one of the objectives of financial reporting is to have some degree of consistency 
as well. And so part of the reason I think that the accounting profession seeks bright lines is to ensure some degree that the objective of the standard is prepared or, or that the filings are prepared with a relative degree of consistency so that companies that are engaging in similar activities can compare, be compared on a comparable basis. Mr. Hertz. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly ag agree with uh, Jim's comments, um, and I believe we've been writing our standards with that focus in mind uh, in recent years. Um, uh, I worked for some time in the profession uh, in the UK, and I'm also a chartered accountant, and that's at one extreme, uh, the consolidation standard. There they're they're very much principles-based, aren't they? principles-based, but, right. but to the point where uh, some believe almost anything goes. There, on the other hand, you know, we in the past have had uh, standards with lots and lots of facts and lots and lots of uh, prescriptive I don't know if you call them rules, but very detailed implementation guidance. Yeah. And I think I think the balance is somewhere in between, starting with the articulation of clear objectives and principles. So, would you say that right now you're you're too far towards the rules based, and that there's we need to come back. Well, we, we're, we're currently doing a lot of our major projects together with the international board. So when we're trying to, we're writing common standards. Uh, and when you're writing common stand, a standard essentially for a good major parts of the world, not just the United States or, or Europe, but other parts of the world that, that, that use IFRS or companies, that, a lot of companies, for example, in Japan use US GAAP. Um, you have to find those, that kind of balance across across the, those 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 varying societies and economies and the like. Mr. Goldsir, do you want to comment? Um, sure. Of course, we don't have responsibility for the accounting standards, so I'll answer as to the uh, auditing standards. Although I think the the answer would be about the same. W we try to take what I would call an objectives-based approach when we set auditing standards, and each of our standards now includes at the beginning a statement of what the objective is. Uh, I, it's imp we are charged with enforcing these standards also, so I think it's important, enough, important to us that they be written in, in, in a clear enough and precise enough way that when we do an inspection or bring an enforcement case, we can make a determination about whether the okay. standard was followed. Let me ask this just because my yellow light, so time is starting to run out. Um, as we harmonize with IFRS and so forth, and as we have these joined, and if we were to move to more of this balance, the risk is that our litigation system is very different <coughs> from that in the UK and in other countries. Um, are we are we putting, I, I mean, we cannot go to a big three, okay? So with Sarbanes-Oxley, you physically can't exist if we go to a big three. Um, are we putting our accounting firms at risk with our current litigation system if we move m to more principles based, which I agree with you guys, I think we should, and are there changes we need to make in our litigation system to enable this to happen and, and harmonize with the international accounting standards, um, but to make the litigation risk not so great if the accounting firms comply with what we ask them to do? Th whoever wants to comment. I agree with the sentiment that going from four to th three would not be a good idea, you know, would not be a good thing. Uh, in terms of the litigation system itself, uh, it's a recommendation out of the Committee on Improvements to Financial Reporting, an SEC advisory committee, actually recommended guidance on how firms and how the SEC might look at judgment in a system that has less prescriptive guidance. And I'm a big supporter of the idea that if a firm exercises, uh, a company or an audit firm exercises reasonable judgment, documents that, thinks about that in the context of what would be useful information to investors that would go a long way for them and then defending in any context the subsequent result of that judgment. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. And now the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster. Thank you. I guess, um, well, I'd like to start out by thanking the ranking member for his concern over the um, liabilities of the GSEs and, um, and of course, had we recognized all of those liabilities at the time that they were um, taken over by the previous administration, it, people would realize that, of course, our financial situation inherited by the current administration was, in fact, far worse than was recognized. Um, um, but what I'd like to ask first, um, 
perhaps um, of Mr. Geltzer is the state of play of countercyclical um, counter cyclical concerns in the definition of, of accounting practices. You know, how seriously is that being incorporated into the next generations of? I really think I would have to defer to my colleagues on that since we have we really have no jurisdiction over the accounting and disclosure okay. principles. Mr. We Harris. have to enforce them as, as they ripen. Well, you know, uh, the uh, accounting standards involve measurements and reporting the uh, the underlying economic situation, including the financial condition of, of the reporting companies, uh, and therefore the goal is to report economic reality, not to adjust it uh, through policy. Um, the now I believe that good accounting can be counter-cyclical in that it, it gives evidence, uh, often early warnings of, of additional risk, additional leverage, uh, those, those kinds of things. Uh, but I think it's then up to regulators and policy makers to take that information and do what they need to do in order to you know, manage the economy and uh, the markets. Okay, so you're not seeing big changes in um and accounting standards. It, it's not regularly incorporated as a as one of the desired aspects of any. We we are change. we are trying to kind of tell it like it is, rather than to uh, you know take numbers and adjust them for policy matters. But other other people can do that and then take the right policy. But I think they need to start with with the number the right numbers. Okay. Yes, Mr. Kirkland. I would agree with. Chairman Hurt's remarks that the objective of financial reporting ought to be neutral, unbiased, unvarnished reporting of the economic circumstances. Um, they are, as a group of standard setters, both the IASB and the FASB, looking at, um, for example, loan loss provisioning and whether or not being more forward-looking, if you will, on the credit cycle would be useful information, would that be un unbiased and useful information to investors, and that's part of that project. The objective isn't outcomes-based in that it would be less pro-cyclical, but would investors have better information if they were uh, aware earlier in the credit cycle of loan loss? Okay. And I guess the next thing I'd like to bring up is a lot of the uncertainties you had surround the valuation of structured financial products and asset-backed securities, things like that. And as you're probably aware, there's an SEC initiative to encourage or mandate the publication of key underlying information on these, you know, including in the case of mortgage-backed securities, you'd have the zip codes, the credit scores, um, you know, the income history, all this sort of thing. Um, and, and as well as the waterfall code that actually specifies the behavior of the tranches and so on. And um, this, in principle, will make things much more transparent. And I was wondering, do you view that as something that's realistically going to be incorporated into the whole accounting um, and valuation game in a much more transparent way? Are you optimistic that that's really going to lead to a sort of a more objective analysis of the values of different tranches of these? Is you view that as an experiment that might or might not work or a fundamental game changer in, in the valuation of these complex financial products? Right, right now it's a proposal by the SEC, so we'll obviously be informed by the feedback that we get. But I, am, uh, I hope that it is um, a significant improvement in terms of price discovery, so that would then flow through all of financial reporting. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Hertz, Joe? Yeah, I've been fairly strong and vocal on this subject. Uh, accounting and reporting by companies was significantly challenged during the crisis essentially because we had uh, markets for which there were not the necessary infrastructures, and that included the markets for certain asset-backed securities. It was very hard to properly value something or provide for anticipated credit losses uh, uh, when there's no price discovery, when the uh, effect of the waterfall and the condition of the collateral is not being, you know, known. Uh, so only it took people with great sophistication and a lot of labor intensity to be able to parse through a lot of these structures in order to, to then better understand what they had and then to value them. So, so I, I, I'm a big supporter of 
trying to put in what's a necessary infrastructure in order to, just from my selfish point of view, but for the, the whole system to be able to, to, to do the better reporting. Okay. Thank you. I guess my red light's on, so I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Now we'll hear from the gentleman from California, Mr. Hurts. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to ask Mr. Hertz a question, and, and it goes to um, it goes to an issue in which uh, IFRS standards, international standards, frankly, would have handled the layman situation a lot differently than we did. Um, under IFRS, um, layman's leverage ratios would have shown up as as much uh, much higher. It would have been harder for them to continue the over leveraging, as I understand it, than they did uh, under the U.S. standards. And FAS 166 amended certain aspects of disclosure related to the classification of assets under FAS 140, requiring an institution to disclose all of its continuing involvement with transferred financial assets. These amendments were related to Lehman Brothers' use of repo 105s to take assets off the books at the end of the reporting period and thereby, of course, disguise the true leverage that was afoot. Lehman officials even referred to these transactions as balance sheet window dressing. You wrote a letter to the committee um, on April 19th, and you mentioned that the accounting guidance for repos has not changed since 1997. And, uh, I guess my question is, should FASB consider amending the standards governing the use of repo transactions in light of the use of repo 105s by Lehman and other financial institutions? And at the end of the day, I guess, to what extent would moving toward IFRS address this problem? Did the Europeans see something coming, coming that we just failed to miss in terms of our accounting of it? A um, couple of uh, uh, points. Um, we're not an enforcement or regulatory agency, but in that letter uh, I did indicate some points as to whether or not uh, the repo 105 transactions actually qualified as sales under U.S. standards. And uh, again, without all the facts, I, I cannot tell, but the SEC uh, has been doing an extensive information gathering process of the practices of major financial institutions with regard to repos and security lending and the like. And to the extent that uh, those reveal uh, practices like that, uh, we stand very ready to, to, change, the, uh, to change the standards. And, and just to get to back to the bottom line, to what extent would moving toward IFRS address this problem? Um, it's not clear to me whether other IFRS, uh, they would have uh, appeared as financing or sales either. Um, we have a joint project with the International Board on the subject of derecognition, which includes these kinds of, kinds of items. And the goal has been to harmonize our, our standards there. There are many other current differences uh, in the way financial institutions uh, balance sheets are reported as between U.S. GAAP and IFRS, including uh, issues as to uh, uh, whether master netting agreements uh, 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 are sufficient to net uh, derivatives uh, and various other things, which we are also exploring harmonizing. I appreciate that. Uh, let me ask Mr. Croker a question as well, and this goes to the testimony that we had from Mr. Uh, Markopoulos here, who noted that for a number of years he tried to warn individuals from within the SEC about uh, the Madoff uh, Ponzi scheme. And he found an ally in the Boston branch with industry experience in the SEC, but his problem was that uh, he could never get beyond the New York office, I guess, because uh, as he says, uh, folks in Washington simply couldn't comprehend the case. Certainly the people in New York that held the case couldn't comprehend it. And he often noted the over-lawyering at the SEC. 
i know mr shapiro is attempting to address this failure but i'm concerned that this won't be enough that the the basic if you look back over the years the focus of the f c c the way it has been over lawyered by those who have informed me that there isn't the technical knowledge about markets in the f c c to really uncover things like the ponzi schemes that are out there has has always been a problem institutionally could you could you comment on that let me comment on my perspective on accounting and auditing our office is approximately fifty people the vast majority are folks who were practicing either as accountants or as auditors so from from that perspective our office again the vast majority is auditors but the to the heart of whether we can be more uh, forward-looking what market practices are out there um, I think we've taken significant steps just as one example we're hiring a deputy within the office of the chief accountant whose job it will be to mark to monitor market practices to look at new standards that have been put in uh, place. Uh, just very quickly the, the SEC official in Boston who did understand it had been a portfolio manager, he'd been a trader, he had that experience in the market, and I think it's that kind of hiring at some point, point that has to be addressed. I understand the British had the same problem with the FAS, so I just I agree. raise it again. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Royce. Uh, does the gentleman have any further questions? Because I do have an additional question. Do you want to take additional time? or? Okay, uh, if I could, in your op in in your oral remarks, uh, Mr. Gelser, you you referred to the the section 7602 fix uh, that we've put in to uh, allow a transmittal of information, investigative findings between foreign entities and the and the American entities, uh, and you indicated that that fixes the EU problem but you caution that that doesn't fix the China problem. And while we're now going from the House and the Senate to conference, I'm, I'm curious whether or not you have structured in your own mind what would fix the China problem so that we could include it in the act when it comes back or what should we do? If we anticipate there will be a problem or there is potentially a problem and we haven't done anything about it, what do you suggest we do? I appreciate the question because it's a very difficult issue. I, I don't think I have an answer as to what Congress could do to fix the problem with, with China. I mean, I mean, let me say, as to the EU, the inf ability to share information would let us you know, essentially resume the negotiations with them, and I'm hopeful it would open the door to inspections. They have raised other issues with, with us that will also have to be resolved. With respect to China, I, I think the best hope we would have at the moment is that as we bring all of the rest of the world into our inspection system, China will not want to be an outlier and will feel an incentive to, to negotiate with us and open the doors there also. I can certainly assure you that if, if we see any kind of legislative action that would help us with with China, I, I will let you know, but at, at the moment, I don't see anything that would address the situation. Well, if we don't address it, and, and are you suggesting it would require some treaty arrangement with China? Um, I, I don't believe that any of these um, foreign auditor access issues we have should require treaties. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a, simply a matter of negotiation and understanding between ourselves and the audit oversight body or other governmental authorities in, in each country. Aren't we one step away from a, a, a China disaster or China meltdown if we don't do something now? I, I think this is a very serious problem. I, I think there's much that's unknown to us about the quality of financial reporting in China and the quality of auditing in China. And there are an increasing number of Chinese-based companies that are in our market. So yes, I, I, I think it's a substantial risk to U.S. investors. Does anyone else have any opinions on that? Or Mr. Ertz, Coker? As it relates to... Uh, well, there's a provision in the reform regulations that are pending that allow 
where it was disallowed before for a transmittal of investigative information between the United States and foreign powers. We've now vitiated that. And Mr. Gelsey's opinion is that takes care of our problem with the EU. But he indicated it doesn't take care of the problem with China. Do you, yeah. do you recognize that I, there may be a problem with China? And do you have any helpful hints? Yes, one, one I agree. And, and a second provision that could be helpful is a provision that is in the uh, House Regulatory Reform Bill uh, on Section 106 of Sarbanes-Oxley that would give us greater ability to subpoena work papers from foreign audit firms. So I think that would be of assistance as well. Okay. And what is that? Does it allow uh, retribution if that if they don't respond to our subpoenas? It, it allows greater access, as, as I understand it, in serving a subpoena to uh, and then enforcing a subpoena for foreign access to foreign work papers. Very good. I, I, if I could just make one brief additional yep. point. I, I, I do want to be clear that we do have existing authority to deregister foreign firms or any firm that doesn't cooperate in an inspection w with us. And I, I don't want to take that off the table as a solution. Obviously, it would have significant ramifications if there were any foreign country where n no auditor, in essence, was registered in, in the United States. But in terms of our existing authority, that's sort of the, the ultimate s step that we could take. Thank you, Mr. Gilson. Gentleman from New Jersey. Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, so what I hear um, in general here and other, other places as well from you folks is that the accounting s standards setting folks are all about the transparency and disclosure and just making sure that the information is out there, right? And then that the it's the regulator's job um, to deal with it, <laughs> to mitigate um, and reconcile the applications of it, and that's the regulator's job to do it. Okay. So we have the uh, financial service reform bill that's going through um, right now, and that has a risk retention element to it, right? Uh, mandates 5% on each loan or bond issue um, uh, be out, held on. Um, and so some folks look at that and say, hey, if you do, if you put that 5% risk retention aspect on it, that's going to sort of tighten down credit availability um, even further than where the markets are today. So with that whole issue out, out there looming right now, is, is it even more important than ever before that you have, I think you, your words have said, a decoupling of the, um, of the accounting rules from what the regulators are putting in place? Or, yeah, the regulators putting in place if you wanted to make sure that we still have some availability of uh, credit availability going forward? Jim? As I understand it, yeah. there, already, there already is that flexibility to decouple Prudential supervision and the measures used by bank supervisors from accounting. Accounting as set by the FASB is the starting point, but they have the flexibility uh, to decouple. So as I understand it, that, that already exists. Uh, but I do think that it calls for uh, continuing coordination between the FASB, the SEC, Prudential supervisors. Uh, as we, we do already, we meet no less than a quarterly basis at the senior staff level with bank supervisors and my staff is talking to their staffs on a, on a real-time, continuous basis. And I, and I see you want to chime in on this. I, I guess the question where we were before all this happened was whether or not that decoupling, to use that expression, really was occurring or not. Uh, Mr. Hertz? Um, it, it, it had occurred to a certain degree. Uh, you know, for example, the bank regulators uh, have traditionally chosen to uh, not factor in unrealized uh, gains and losses on debt securities into their computations of, of regulatory, uh, regulatory capital, even though for gap reporting, it, it does affect the amount of stockholders' equity that's, that's, that's reported. Um, on the, you know, our changes uh, under statements 166 and 167, we uh, did uh, um, involve them, keep them very well apprised as we were going along in the development of those. Uh, they did factor them into the stress test last year, and then they, they followed up uh, late last year, early this year, with um, 
uh, some guidance on the impacts uh, that those new standards would have under their regulatory capital determinations, but they did provide a transition period for uh, the regulated ent institutions to, to build the additional capital. Okay. Okay. Um, as long as you're still talking. Um, with regard to the whole um, convergence issues, which you touched upon, some other people talked about, the G G20 has uh, recommended, uh, you know, pro-cyclicality and accounting standards. Uh, accounting rules work together with the banking regulators to be less pro-cyclical accounting. The, the ISAB has been working with the banking regulators, investors, and others, and all in the one point, other, we haven't hit this too much yet today, and that is on the um, one issue of mark-to-market, and that they've said, they don't want mark, mark to market. You all take a contrary view, I guess you could put it. So um, can you just lay that out a little bit as to why we're taking a contrary view as to where the G20, the banking regulators, and the investors are all on this issue? Well, the, the you know, my understanding, uh, the, the G20, or there's a group under the G20, the, the Financial Stability Board, which, which actually I meet with periodically, uh, as well, um, you know, obviously being a financial stability board, uh, their first interest is in, in stability of the overall uh, system. Um, you know, our job, and I, I have absolutely nothing totally for stability, uh, but our job's, you know, more transparency for investors, uh, uh, make the capital allocation process work better. So we work very closely with the banking regulators uh, to try to understand their points of view. We work closely with investors to understand their points of view. We get the points of view of the, uh, of the companies and we really try to square the circle in terms of meeting all of those different needs in, 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 in ways. And a lot of investors would like to see more information on the current values of the financial assets of institutions. Okay. So you're sort of just saying you have a slightly different role than some of those, okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Campbell? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to follow up a little bit on, on something Mr. Garrett was on with you, Mr. Hertz, on, on um, standard 166, 167. If there's a, a, a risk retention requirement, you've got to keep 5% bank sells off, you know, a loan um, into securitization, but they've got to keep a slice of it. They've got to keep 5%. Under 166, 167, that bank's got to keep that whole loan on their no? Okay, I'm wrong. Talk to me. It really depends on the um, what the five percent represents. If it if it is represents the first loss, yes. In effect, they're like the equity par participant in the transaction. They absorb the first losses. Is if it's more of a pro rata uh, five percent retention, um, it would not that would not be deemed significant. Okay, but if it is the first loss. Uh, then they do have to keep the entire uh, loan on their books, right? Yeah. Right, okay. So this is the kind of place, and, uh, you know, at, again, as we do these prescriptive, <laughs> uh, very pre prescriptive accounting standards, this is the sort of thing where when you did that probably weren't anticipating this sort of thing, and there may be some other actions in the future where uh, we've got a lot of banks with a lot of, debt, that, that there may be various ways that that debt can be moved to other places, but where they're going to have to keep a slice of it somewhere in order to make the whole transaction work, but we're trying to, to try and make some of these banks a little more solvent than they are in the future. Where And this is where I think you can see that divergence between we may set up some banking regulation in order to try and make this thing work out, and then you look at, F, uh, at standard 167 and it says, ooh, ooh. Um, that as far as the, the audited balance sheet of this bank, it's, gonna, it's not going to improve it at all. Um, how, not, a, not a problem, and I'm curious for any of you, not in that specific instance, not a problem. Um, you guys can look at it and respond or quickly or what? I, in that instance, it, I don't view it as a problem as you said you had in Bob's example, and it's not – prescriptive in the standard, the, the objective is if you have significant skin in the game, if you will, significant risk, and you have control, you need to consolidate. If it was 5% Well, 
Right, but I mean, you, you, you got to have the majority of the, you know, let's say it's very high quality assets. You might actually have most of the risk of those assets. And so I think that's the principle of the standards. If you have, in that fact pattern, if you have most of the risk of those assets, maybe they ought to be on your well books. So not a problem, though, in terms of being able to respond quickly. Okay, and I guess part of it is, you know, you have a $3 million loan. If you have a $3 million loan, you can lose $3 million in theory, and that's on your books and so forth. But if that loan goes somewhere else and you have some tranche of it that is first lost but gives you a maximum $200,000 loss, let's just say, um, is that a different situation it, it's think of it in these terms if you had a a, a, a company uh, and uh, had some risk in it and you were the equity investor and the rest of the capital is pro provided by other people in the form of debt financing um, but you know and you also ran the show I think you'd agree under long-standing accounting you would consolidate that entity <laughs> And so that's the basic analogy there. Yeah, no, I, all right. But, but I guess, it, does it bother any of you if there is this divergence in transactions like I just described between the, the financial accounting standard and the way the banking regulators will treat the transaction? You know, I think in an ideal world, we would have the same reporting for uh, financial reporting, for regulatory reporting, for tax reporting, but because they all start from different objectives, sometimes that's not possible. Okay. Thanks, President. In, in the instance of 166 and 167, I think, as I understand it, as bank regulators have, have looked at those standards, they've actually indicated it will help them do a better assessment of risk. And in fact, um, a process like that went through um, or was included in the, uh, the, the stress tests effectively taking FASB's new guidance and saying, would we get a better um, identification of risk through these new standards? Okay, quickie question for Mr. Geltzer on my way out here. Um, uh, uh, related to something else, I mentioned before about the markets using different data than the traditional uh, three elements of the financial statement. Are there things that we ought to be, are there element, and a lot of that comes from audited data, but does it all? And are there things that we ought to be auditing numbers that ought to be audited for public companies that aren't currently being audited because the markets are using them. Mm. Thanks. I, this is a hard question for me to answer in, in that form. I think from our perspective, the important thing would be that the scope of the auditor's responsibilities are clear and that we're, if, if we are going to bring in additional information that's not currently part of the financial statements, that it, it be information that's auditable, not so re dependent on, on judgments or management assessments that an auditor can't develop evidence to support an, an opinion on it and that we have a chance to write a, a, a standard. I mean, as to what the sort of the content would be of, of additional uh, such information brought under the auditing intent, I, th I think I'd have to think about that a little. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Captain. Now, the other gentleman from California, Mr. Rhodes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm going to uh, follow up on Mr. Garrett and Mr. Campbell's line of questioning here uh, because uh, last week we had uh, FASB's uh, Kevin Stoklasa submit testimony here that in, in many ways um, recognized or, or admits, you know, a certain dichotomy here, a, a certain problem when it comes to the impact or effect of this decision. He said, uh, he said that keeping assets on the books will better reflect financial institutions' exposures to risk, but may also, in his words, affect their ability to comply with the regulatory capital requirements and therefore affect the liquidity available to um, real estate in the U.S. to, to uh, commercial real estate specifically. And one of the debates <coughs> that we have had about the vicious circle that we've got ourselves caught in is uh, the fact that in many cases you have performing loans, but banks aren't allowed to be banks right now. Uh, you know, if the appraisal, if the appraisal comes back and it's and uh, the value, you know, isn't what the, what's necessary there, regardless of the fact that it's a performing loan and in the past maybe you'd keep it on the books and you, you have to, uh, 
you have to make that tough decision because the regulator is breathing down your neck. And, and at that hearing, you had several witnesses involved in the commercial real estate industry express their grave concerns over this accounting treatment. And I, I guess uh, we're just getting back to what is FASB's response to those concerns, in this case, raised and acknowledged by, you know, uh, your, your technical advisor there, uh, by Kevin in that hearing last week. You know, at some way, at some point in time, do you give the banks the ability to work out some of these problems using their best judgment? And then I, I'd also just ask, uh, you know, the SEC's perspective there as well, because you'll have to deal that this will affect, you know, companies that you oversee as we get become more and more rigid in terms of the way in which we define uh, and, and uh, control the ability of bankers to use their judgment. Uh, ultimately, you oversee those, those uh, firms. You might have a comment on this. So go ahead, please. Mr. Hertz. Well, you know, again, the, um, you know, the goal of financial reporting is to uh, reflect the underlying economic reality uh, as, best, as best we can with the, the, the tools available and, and often requiring the necessary judgment of the, the companies and the, the auditors uh, involved. Um, the, you know, we believe the new standard strikes the right balance in, in that area. The bank regulators seem to agree that for their purposes it, it, it does uh, as well. I mean, you know, arguably uh, some of the problems in the, uh, that caused the crisis were, uh, you know, too much free reign, too much liquidity, too much things that, that were improperly shown off the balance sheets and the risks not, not yet. Mr. Hertz, I grant you all of that, and I concur with that. But somehow when you get to the point where you have performing loans which no longer make the test, you're, you're in something of uh, uncharted waters here when you notice that it begins to have this domino effect in communities. Uh, and it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy in that sense. I mean, if you... If, if you don't roll over these performing loans because you you don't make these technical, the, the reality is they're performing loans, at least for here and now. And, and, and that's sort of the dichotomy I think we're in, right? Uh, well, I'm not sure that those are elements of 166 or 167. If no, but the, but, hold, but, but the, the, the further crimp on liquidity for commercial real estate compounds this problem where we already have this lack of liquidity and we just keep tightening the screws on that and at the end of the day uh, there isn't the capital there and so the decision is made not to roll over the performing loan on well the basis the, the of the lack again, of Again, the, the capital requirements uh, are things that the bank regulators determine. They've, mm -hmm. they've given some forbearance for a transition period related to our new standard but they yeah concluded that the new standard provides a better basis for them to make determin the capital determinations, but that's, that's them. Let me ask the SEC very quickly and then I'm finished. I, I, I don't think banks should have greater flexibility in terms of keeping risk off balance sheet. Um, and as it's probably a better question for bank regulators, but again, as I understand it, they have the flexibility then in terms of how they'll respond if that risk is on balance sheet. Yeah, the, the flexibility hasn't been used to our uh, ability to discern it, <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Royce. Uh, isn't, isn't it surprising this, this actually was an interesting commentary when I started out. I, I, I suggested that we, who are not accountants, could get bored to death, but quite frankly, I, I really enjoyed uh, the witnesses' testimony. I want to thank them, and I want to uh, uh, send this message to you. In the next several weeks, or week we will be convening a conference on the Senate and the House bill as it presently exists. And there obviously are needs uh, to reconcile some differences and potentially add some parts of the bill that, are, that, that may be missing. And all three of you witnesses are in a peculiar and favored position to be able to uh, help the committee as we uh, put the final 
bill together that if you see something lacking uh, i can assure you i'm one telephone call away and i'm sure uh, mr garrett's one telephone call away we're looking for the the best expert help in structuring the finest uh, uh, enforcement bill we can put together to make sure although we hear this all the time that this will never happen again i for one can see something's going to happen again so we shouldn't use that terminology but that we could gain a great deal from the crisis of 18 months ago and certainly put a piece of legislation in place that will forestall that type of activity for help or for occurring again for many 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 decades and toward that end i solicit your assistance and help and any of my staff that don't take your calls you let me know and we'll have new staff in place but i know they will and we want to encourage you to take advantage of that invitation so with that the chair notes that some members may have additional questions for this panel which they may wish to submit in writing without objection the hearing record will remain open for 30 days for members to submit written questions to these witnesses and to place their responses in the record without objection it is so ordered before we adjourn the following materials will be made part of the record of this hearing a letter of may twentieth from the independent community bankers of america without objection it is so ordered the panel is dismissed and this hearing is adjourned thank you gentlemen